thank you all for being with us tonight. Apparently the word got out. Moses wouldn't be here, so it's, maybe we're a little more sparse than we used to be or usually are, but I do thank you for being here, and I just pray you'll be blessed as we study God's word together. Uh, as we say all the time, this is a Bible church, so if you've got your Bible with you, you may want to go ahead and find Matthew chapter 6. We're actually going to be uh, concentrating on verses 33 and 34, but I'm going to start further back than that tonight as we uh, try to share the word with you. And I just want to share with you, as I prepared this, God gave me this maybe three weeks ago, and I didn't know why. And last week, at some point, Moses said, uh, hey, could you preach this coming weekend? I said, yeah, sure. Be glad to. Thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity. And so as I prepared this message, I thought, you know, a lot of my life I didn't get this exactly right this scripture we're going to talk about. So as I challenge you tonight, and I hope I challenge you in a lot of ways, understanding I'm challenging me, just like I'm challenging you. I've found this a very challenging part of scripture. And we're going to deal a lot with the word seek tonight. You've heard us say more than once, if the Bible uses a word two or three times, is it fairly important, you think? Well, in the King James Version of the Bible, the word seek appears in some form or another 309 times. So I think God wants us to be seekers. So if you, uh, Paul, do you have the definitions we, I gave you? I want you to, I, there are several different as I went through the Bible, I looked at the several different languages of the word seek. And English is probably one of the uh, words that maybe we don't put as much emphasis behind. You know, when I think about seek in the English language, I think about playing hide and seek as a kid. Remember that? Huh? Yeah, you, somewhere was based and somebody counted to whatever, 100 maybe, and everybody hid and then... If you got back to base without getting tagged, you were all right. But if you got tagged, you were it, and it went on. And that's, I think, a lot of what we think about uh, in the English language. It, it says to go in search of, to look for something. In the Hebrew, there are four words that are used, and I'm not going to try to pronounce them. They're up there. If you know Hebrew better than I do, you can pronounce them. But they all translate to inquiring or consulting about something. And then as I looked at the Greek definition... And I am not a Greek scholar, so I'm going to tell you this. Every, every time I lay Greek on you, check me out because you need to, real, need to know that I know that I've searched enough to understand what it means. But in the Greek definition, the word is zateo, and it means to investigate, to reach a binding solution, or to strive after. Now, isn't that a little more passionate? than just saying seek in the English language? Think about that. To investigate, to reach a binding solution, to strive after. So I started there because I kind of wanted us to lay a little background of what we're doing. And as always, before I ever get in God's word, I'd like you to pray with me. So pray with me, please. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity to come and speak from your word. Lord, let your words flow. Lord, as always, remove self and let your Holy Spirit have total dominance. Father, your word is perfect and holy. Mine can be very fallible. Lord, you are perfect and holy. I am very fallible. So, Lord, as we study your word and as we read your words tonight, just, Lord, please touch it. Let your Holy Spirit illuminate it. Lord, let your word free flowly. And let's just touch our hearts and our lives and our minds as we ingest your word into our hearts. And Lord, let us live your word daily. Thank you, Jesus, for being with us. Thank you for being in us and us in you. And Lord, I just pray now that we honor and glorify you in all that we do here this evening. It's in your precious and holy name I pray. Amen. So let's begin in verse 24 of the sixth chapter of Matthew. I 
I'll give you a chance if you haven't gotten there yet to, to get there. I'm, I'm told sometimes I jump scripture too quickly for everybody. So Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 24. And uh, I do have to tell you, I use the King James Version. A lot of people don't. That's whatever, whatever version works for you, use, okay? But that's what I use, so. Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. The word mammon there actually refers to worldly goods. Too many times we think it means money. It means the things that are of the world. Verse 25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor for your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow and how they toil. Uh, not neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which, is, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall not he much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take, no, take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient under the day is the evil thereof. I think as a younger man, it may, maybe this is America. Maybe this is what goes on in America. But I am pretty convicted as a younger man. I may have known this scripture, but I don't know that I subscribe to it nearly as much as I should have. I pray that today I subscribe to it much, much more. I'm getting, I'm getting closer, I'm getting older, but I'm getting closer. And so I, I really, uh, as I brought this to you, as I bring this to you tonight, I really want to help you and help me establish our priorities where they should be. As I said in verse 24, it says, you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is the things of the world. We all want something, right? Everybody's looking for something. Have you ever really wanted something so bad you could just taste it? I mean, it was important. You needed it. Oh, golly, it was so going to be the most fantastic thing that ever happened to you. And then you got it. And you went, really? That's all it amounts to? Guys... Jesus is going to tell us so much here. Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, for your body. He goes on. He talks about the fowls of the air. And you know something interesting about the fowls of the air? They get fed, right? They get fed naturally, okay? I mean, they, they don't punch a time clock. They don't cook. They don't do it. They just get fed. But you know what? They still have to go out and look for it. Have you noticed that? So we live in an age of entitlement, I believe. And nowhere do I see in God's word that we are entitled to everything that we want or everything we think we need. Because the fowls of the air eat. Yes, they have food. God sends them food. He provides for them but if that bird sits on the limb of the tree all day long or sits in a nest all day long, it's going to be a mighty hungry bird. It has to get out and hunt for something to eat. Guys, we have to be involved in whatever God's going to put us into. 
so he can provide for us. I want to just bring that out. Verse 27 says, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature? Now, many of the other versions say, which of you by worrying can add one moment to your life? Huh? Absolutely none. Ab that, very true. And you know, in Luke's gospel, chapter 12, it says that adding time to our lives or adding uh, interest to our stature is the easiest thing for God to do. It is the least thing that requires any effort on his part is to say, guess what? You're going to live whatever you live. Whatever. It, is there any way you, when you were born, could have said, well, I'm living now, and I'm going to grow up, and I'm going to be six foot one inches tall. That, that's my decision. That's what I'm going to be. That's where I want to be, and that's, that's what I'm going to do. No, you can't, right? Or when you got born, you said, okay, I'm alive now. I'm going to live, and I don't know how many minutes, or in a lifetime. But let's just for argument's sake say there are 25,000 minutes in a lifetime. So you say, I'm going to live 25,102 minutes. That's my decision. That's how long I'm going to live. Right. Not one of us can do that. Amen. Not one of us can do what we're doing here. God's saying that, look, I've got this. And what would be just absolutely impossible for us is the easiest thing for God to do. God can extend our lives. God can make us whatever our statue is. It's all up to him. It's all up to him. Hello. <laughs> Hello. In verses 28 and 29, it talks about Solomon. Why take thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field. If they grow and they neither toil nor they spin. And I say to you that Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. How many know Solomon was pretty well to do? I looked back in the, in the Old Testament, and you can check this out in, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 10. But apparently Solomon deposited in his treasury annually 25 tons of gold. Yeah, 25 tons of gold. I kind of kind of figured that out. Good. I looked looked it up actually. What, how much that equaled? Today that would equal 63 billion with a B dollars. Annually, that's what went into Solomon's treasury, not including what his shipping uh, business brought in, not including what his merchants and his craftsmen brought in. Solomon's pretty well off. I got a feeling Solomon didn't shop at Walmart. I've got a feeling that whatever was the finest thing you could get to put on in Solomon's time, he wore it. Money was no object. And yet God's saying that, look at the lily, look at the fields, look at the glorious creation of God. Have, we've all seen the pictures of the mountains with just miles of flowers in them and how beautiful they are. And how great they are. And God says, I did that. You didn't. I did that. So it's so interesting to me that we worry about so much of the stuff we worry about. And we have to be spot on with whatever is the fad of the moment. Have you noticed that? Karen alluded to dinner announcements of the things the kids wear in these days. My, my, my. I remember when our son was in high school and he had to have a pair of lucky jeans. Y'all ever heard of lucky jeans? I never had. A hundred and some dollars for a pair of jeans. I'm saying, you've got to be kidding me. For a kid that's growing? I mean, please. For a kid that's growing? 
I don't think so. Uh, son, when you get employed, if you want to go down and spend $100 for a pair of jeans, feel free to have at it. But dad's not buying a $100 pair of jeans. I've never had a $100 pair of jeans in my life. Don't want a $100 pair of jeans. And I just go and, what is wrong with society? What has happened in all of this mess? Eventually he did. He, when, he got, when he got a job and got older, he got them. Hope he enjoys them. Yeah. I guess they're out of style. I'm probably dating myself, so anyway. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, amen, brother. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Sometimes we need to change that to O me of little faith. Amen. Hey, God knows what we need. And he is talking to us here. And what are we doing when we say, oh, me of little faith? Or when, we, when God says to us, if you don't trust me for this, what, what is he doing when he says, oh, oh, ye of little faith? He is saying, honestly, that we don't believe him. That we don't have enough faith and trust in him to think that he can and he will do what he says he will do. You want to hear something that really may get hard on you? In essence, we're saying, God, you're a liar because you promised us this and I don't think you can do it. So, oh, me of little faith. That's tough, isn't it? That's tough. I've been there. I have been, oh, me of little faith too many times in my life. But I'm asking God to please, please, please bring me where I need to be. Bring me where I need to be. Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after these things do the Gentiles seek, for your Father, Heavenly Father, knoweth you have need of all these things. The Gentiles in that particular scripture really translates to one who has no knowledge of God the Father. That's exactly what he's saying. He's saying that if you have knowledge of God the Father, you can trust God the Father because he can bring to you whatever you need. Sometimes we don't trust. I thought about not doing this but will you give me grace to relate a little story to you about learning to trust? Years ago, Marty and I, when we were in the youth ministry, we took a group of kids to a truth concert, concert, which was a contemporary Christian group. We loaded a bunch of kids on the bus. We take them to the truth concert, and we are at the concert, and they take a love offering. I looked in my billfold, and this has been a long time ago, guys. So this was a good bit of money to me. I had $25. Okay. So I was going to be that trusting, wonderful man of God. And that's all we had for the week. Now there's like 47 cents in the bank. And we've got a child that's going to have to have diapers and whatever food he's going to have to have. And we've got to have gas. And we've got to do everything we're going to do that week. So I'm going to be sacrificial. And I take the $5 out of my billfold. And I'm holding it in my hand, and the plate comes along, and I put it in the plate. And to my shock and dismay, the $20 bill hit the plate. And I'm watching it go down the aisle. Honestly, I hadn't been too embarrassed. I'd have gone and gotten it back. <laughs> but I was just too embarrassed to do that. And we walked out of the, the uh auditorium and we're going to get to the bus and getting the kids gathered up and counting those just to make sure we have the right amount of kids that don't want, don't want one extra in heavenly days don't want one too little you know so we're getting all the kids counted up Marty says did you give it the love offering I said, oh yeah oh yeah I gave she says well what's that mean so I told her my little story and she said well God take care of us 
I said, well, he'll have to because, you know, what are we going to do? I don't, so Monday morning comes, and we go to work, and we have $5. I mean, you know. So on the way home Monday, Marty says, well, we need to stop and get Jay Jr. what all he needs. And I think we spent about three of the $5 on that. Tuesday comes. Car is halfway between empty and positively. <laughs> and so we, we've got to put gas in the car. We, we've got to go to work. Puts $2 worth of gas in the car. Now we're broke. I'm talking about broke. And I'm thinking we're, we're going to work Wednesday and we, God will at least let us all be in the same area where we can all ride in one vehicle. And I'm thinking Wednesday, I think there is no way in heaven we're going to be able to get to work today tomorrow and Friday for payday. Can't happen. Car's not going to run on fumes. Man, I don't know what we're going to do. It was just Marty and me. We were kind of by ourselves. We lived at that time way out in the woods in the Ocala National Forest. So it's Wednesday night, and I decide, well, I'll stop by the post office because where we lived, it was better for us to have a post office box. So I'll stop by the post office. I go, I open up the the post office, I take all the mail out, and of course all the regular mail, and I find a, a letter that didn't look quite right, and I'm going, I don't even know who, and I don't even remember who it was from or whatever, but I open the letter up, and I'm thinking, man, it's been a bad time for us. There was no note, there was nothing, just a check for $40. I'm going, wow, how in the world, you know, and I'm my bait and feet to Marty, hey, honey, we're all right. Look at this. There's a check for $40. And she's, I told you it'd be all right. <laughs> oh, me of little faith. You know what? God can do the miracles that God can do when they're just needed. I'm reading a book, and Mimi and I were talking about by Franklin Graham right now. And he, he tells about two ladies who were missionaries in, I think it was India. And no money, no money, needs a hospital and everything else. And Franklin Graham says that the trouble was every time they needed money, they'd pray. And they'd just pray for the specific amount they needed. And he says, and you know what? Every time, just before there was no hope, the money would arrive. And he asked him, he says, well, I don't understand. You don't pray for, you know, send money to us, Lord. You don't... You don't uh, uh, advertise to everybody you need money. You just pray for what you need. And they told him, yeah, that's right. Only thing we have to have, I don't think we ask God for is what we need, and he always shows up right on time. Guys, all these things the Gentiles, those that don't know God, have need of. But then he really, the rubber hits the road on verse 33 of Matthew 6. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So we need to understand that we are going to understand he is a binding solution. And it doesn't say when everything else fails, begin to seek the kingdom. It says seek ye first. First, the kingdom. You see, the kingdom is that land where the royalty is the ruler. We don't do too well with that in the United States of America. We don't relate to a king very well. But if, you, if we would live in a kingdom, if we would live in a monarchy, when the king said do something, you know what we would do? Whatever the king says, because it would go very bad with us if we didn't do what the king says. And the king said here, seek ye first his kingdom, and a little bit further, and his righteousness. So it means not only do we seek the face of God, we seek the commandments of God. We seek the obedience to God that we need to do. We need to understand that it is so important for the world to see us serving in the kingdom of God. 
You see, if we will be what we need to be and show the world what the spiritual kingdom is all about and the glorious reign of the Messiah, people are going to begin to flock to get that same thing that's out there that's available to every, every believer. Because he promises, this is a promise. Verse 33 is a promise, guys. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You know, a lot of times we leave that out in church. We talk about seeking Jesus. We talk about praising God. We talk about everything. But we, when it comes down to saying, but now the rubber meets the road, when we begin to follow his commandments, we don't want to hear that nearly as much as we want to hear, yeah, but it's good old God. He'll forgive me for everything. Well, there is an element of truth in that, but it comes with a lot of needing to really understand what it says. So as we need, we need to do that, and all these things, everything will be added onto us. We are supposed to prioritize our lives. You know that? And so, what's the priority? Who's first? God. Now, as I've said going into this, I'm afraid a lot of my life, that wasn't a true statement. Because I've done worried about things. You know, worry, all that's doing is, is saying that God, I'm not sure you can fulfill what you say you can do. Usually when I get a chance like this, I pick on Marty. <laughs> I want you to know that at the, the age and the time we are in our lives now, my honey usually doesn't worry about hardly anything. Anytime something comes up, she will go, God's going to take care of it. But when we first got married, and she will, I think, admit this, that wasn't necessary necessarily the case. My honey worried about everything. True? I mean, I used to tease her. It was so bad that if there was nothing to worry about, she'd worry about whatever was going to be coming that she was going to need to worry about. <laughs> Thank God he's delivered her from that. And you know what? He can deliver us from all that. You know, I don't know what's worrying you this, this evening, but give it to God. Amen. Just give it to God. Lord, just I want to seek you first. I want to seek your righteousness first. I want to do everything that you've called me to do first. I think I shared with Paul a quote from Max Licato. And this, is, this was a kick in the teeth for me. Maybe a kick in the teeth for you. I've sat in a lot of prayer meetings over the years. You probably have too. And almost every prayer meeting I have sat in pretty much goes the same way. And you, if you agree with me, that you can agree with me. And if you don't, well, you don't have to. But usually it is. God, I need help with my finances. God, I need help with my health. God, I'm having this trouble. This needs to be fixed in my life. God, I'm having this relationship problem. God, I need this. God, I need that. God, I need the other. I loved what Max Licato said here. When, the, when we move from the desire for the things of God and the favor of God and desire just to know God, we have crossed a threshold. Man, what I want to see our prayer life come to is just come together as a group of believers and just say, God, we want to know you more. God, we want more of you. God, we want you to impact our lives. We know that you know what we need. And he just said, and he just said that he knows what we need. We know that you know what we need, God. We believe you and we trust you and we honor you and we think we, we know that you can take care of all those. So, God, what we want, what, what our prayer, our passionate prayer needs to be is, God, we want to know more of you who you are. We want to know more of your 
your power. We want to know more of your love. We want to know more of your attitude. We want to know, we want to know you. We just, God, we come, we come broken, fallible human beings, and we just want to know you in a deeper and more intimate manner. I honestly believe that our Monday night prayers, if we would come and begin to worry about that and begin to make that the priority and that the first place, that God will honor that. And there is absolutely no telling the miracles we would see. I am passionate about Monday night prayer life. I am very passionate about Monday night prayer life. And let me, I don't want to put anybody, I don't want any guilt trips on you, okay? But I'm still going to lay one on you. We prepare communion every Monday night. And I have been praying, Marty's been praying, Moses has been praying for at least 20 people to come on a Monday night. We prepare 20 to 24 cups of communion every Monday night. I am so looking forward to the Monday night where we have to scramble and go, we have got to get more communion ready because we prepared this much and hey, there's a lot more people than, than we thought there was going to be. And I pray when we do that, we'll come together wanting to understand and know and say, God, we just come to seek you. We just come to seek you. We just come to honor and glorify and share with each other that we want to seek you. He ends with a very interesting statement in verse 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of its, itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. A lot of the versions say the trouble thereof. And you know, that's a New Testament proverb, is exactly what that is. And where it says that the, the evil or the trouble thereof, it actually is all, it's kind of alluding to a, a crop that is destroyed by a huge hailstorm. I mean, you, you think about that. Think about this farmer that raised a great crop of corn, higher than your head, as far as you can see, and there's beautiful ears of corn on, and it's just about harvest time, and all of a sudden this devastating hailstorm comes through and beats it all flat to the ground. That's a day of trouble, right? That's a day of trouble. Jesus said that, you know what, what he's actually telling us, troubles are going to come. Did you know that? He never promised us a trouble-free life. He just promised us he'd be with us through all the troubles. He would be right with us. He would walk with us through those troubles, and he'll bring us out the other side, and we'll be victorious. Isn't that a great thing? I'm going to do this because I want to kick over a sacred cow. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And I'm winding down. We're going to finish here in just a moment. How many have heard this? Give your life to Jesus Christ. Make Jesus the Lord of your life. Anybody ever hear that? No. I've heard it. I've said it. I've done all of that. Let me explain something, guys. We don't make Jesus anything. Jesus makes us who we are. And I'm going to give my life to Jesus? Really? Who gave me life to begin with? Jesus. It came from him. I don't have it. He gave it to me. I didn't create it. He did. What it really is when we come to know Christ as Savior, and it's, I wanted to get this out tonight, it's a life exchange program. You see, what happens when I accept Christ as my Savior, he becomes alive in me. I become alive in him. My life is gone. Gone. I don't give it to him. He already had it. He already owned it. He already had complete, absolute domination and dominion over it. But what I want to do, what, people, what we need to see people do is say, I want to lay this life down 
that so far hadn't been the best it could be. Amen? Been there? Been there when, when life has just fallen apart all around you? And you say, I want to lay this life down and I want to accept, I want to pick up the life in Jesus Christ. I want Christ's life in me so I can be alive in him. Now listen, those statements I made, they're good statements. They are good statements. And it's a way of putting it out there where people can understand or try to understand what it means to accept the gift of salvation. But sometimes we need to understand that everything is going to change at that moment. A lot of times we don't believe that. But I will tell you this, and I believe this of all my heart. If Jesus Christ has saved you, your life changed drastically from that moment on. And I will promise you this, in my opinion, and who am I? But if I look at you and I see the exact same thing going on in your life, the day after you accepted Christ as your Savior, and the day after that, and the day after that, as was going on before you accepted him, I would question that you ever were saved to begin with. Guys, I I don't say that for any other reason than this. You're the only one that knows your heart. Jesus Christ knows your heart, and you know your heart. You know whether you exchanged, whether you said, let my life be given up and let your life come into me. And if you've done that, man, grab hold of the promises. Grab hold of the promises. What did he just say? Seek him. And when we're seeking him, we'll be seeking his righteousness. We'll be looking for to be obedient to his commandments. And what did he promise us? I got the rest of it. I got the rest of it. Whatever else that may be bothering you, whatever else that may be giving you a problem, whatever else that you think that cannot be overcome, he's just promised you. If you'll just do, if you'll just get your priorities straight, if we'll just get our priorities straight, then I got the rest of it. I got the rest of it. I hope you know that tonight. I hope everyone here knows that tonight, and I hope everyone here has accepted Christ as Savior. But I will tell you, if you haven't, if you've ever come to that point where you really, really accepted Christ as your Savior, don't leave here without doing that. And you don't have to bother, you don't have to come to me. Who am I? I'm just somebody that's trying to do his best to share the word. You can go to anybody or you can go just one-on-one to Jesus Christ. That is the beauty of of the God we serve. It's a, one, it's a one-to-one relationship. You don't need anybody to, intercede, to, to run inter- interference for you. Uh, back 100 years ago when we had uh, long-distance telephones, you remember those? Anybody remember any of that stuff? Or just me? You know, God always had an 800 number and it was never busy. And it's the same thing today. It's a one-on-one. God, I need you. God, I'm undone without you. Thank you, Jesus, for paying my sin debt on the cross. If, you've done, if you do that tonight, we'd love to hear from you because we'd love to celebrate with you. Because the word says the angels in heaven throw a party every time somebody does that. You know what? That's... The, that is, now, that is hallelujah ground when that happens. So, guys, I appreciate you listening to me this evening. I appreciate God's word. I hope that maybe we've touched on some things that will make you think. I hope that we've touched on some things that maybe you hadn't realized exactly the way they are before. I pray this. Every time, we come into prayer with our Lord let's just come into prayer humbly saying God 
It's all on you. I want to know you more. I want to love you better. I want to serve you more, Lord. And quit worrying about laying out the laundry list. Have you ever heard the acronym ACTS? A-C-T-S? It's, a, it's actually the diagram for prayer. Adoration, tell him how much you love him. Confession, tell him, you know what? You're perfect, I'm not. Thanksgiving, and most of us could stop right there because if we would really begin to count everything we've got to be thankful for, this one-hour prayer meeting on Monday night would turn into a 10-hour prayer meeting on, one day, on Monday night. And then the S, the last thing you do is supplication. Lord, we have some needs. We need to get there, guys. We need to get there where we absolutely are just trusting him totally and completely. I shared my little story with you about my lesson in sacrificial giving. And it was certainly not one I wanted to learn. It was certainly not one I expected to follow. And I never will forget the feeling I had, the sinking feeling I had as I watched that $20 bill disappear into, into the darkness wherever it went. And I thought, oh my goodness, what have I done? I'll go to my grave knowing I took that $5 bill out and knowing God, God takes what he wants. God can get what he wants. So we are, as always, going to take an offering tonight. You pray about it. I'm going to close in prayer here in just a moment. And you give whatever God tells you to give. You know, I don't know your finances. You don't know my finances. But God knows it all. He knows what you've got. He knows what you need. And he's just promised you. He's just promised you from his word. If we'll just seek him above everything else, put him first, he's got the rest of it covered. Pray with me, please. Father God, I thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity. And Lord, I never know if I've done your word justice. Father, I always feel so inadequate because there's so much, so much in your word, Lord, and it's alive. And it is just precious, Lord. Your word is just precious. So I pray your word goes out to these, your people. And I pray, Father, that everyone here has been uplifted and challenged to some degree. Lord, I know that over my life, you have challenged me in these areas. And thank you, Father, that I'm doing a little better. I'm not there yet. As Brother Paul said, I haven't attained what needs to be. But Lord, I desire to be. I believe, Father, everybody in this room desires to be exactly what you've called them to be. Father, I ask now that you would bless this offering. Lord, multiply it. Use it for your honor and for your glory. Lord, let us never give out of a feeling of obligation. Lord, let us just give because we love you. And Lord, never, ne let us never give out of a formula that we owe, we owe this or we owe that. Lord, I just ask that you allow us to worship you in our giving. Father, that you might be honored and glorified and your work might go forward. I ask, Father, you bless those that can give as well as those that can't give. And Father, I ask as we go from this place tonight, we will go desiring to seek a deeper, deeper relationship, a deeper feeling, a deeper longing, Lord, for you in all that we do. I thank you, Father, that Monday night we're going to need more cups. I believe that, Lord. I believe you can bring the people to come together to just seek you in prayer and know your Holy Spirit is with us and know that you are here to meet with us and to correct us and to love us and to bless us. 
Thank you, Jesus, for what you're going to do in this place. Father, I ask a blessing on our pastor as he's taken a few days away. Give him rest, Lord. Bless him as you see fit in his entire family. And Lord, now I just ask that as the, the people come to pick up the plates, that you would bless this giving. And Lord, after that, that we would worship you again, Father, as we sink to you, as we glorify you. Lord, we don't want to sing about you. We want to sing to you. We want you, Lord, to understand. We want you to know that you're the priority. Lord, we praise you and you alone. And we love you. And we thank you, Father, for all the many blessings. And I thank you for tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.